Uh, there are a number of other things. I think one thing that is interesting that I'd like to show you now, and there are so many people who uh, wonder a little bit about the length of the pulse and the length of the silent period, and uh, I, I think that we should, uh, we should put this up here now so that you get a rough idea. We had a radar set that put out 2,000 pulses per second. 2,000 pulses per second. If a radar set is putting out 2,000 pulses per second, it means that each pulse is one two thousandth of a second in length. One two thousandth of a second in length. We want to break this down to microseconds because that's what we're going to be dealing with. One two thousandth of a second is the same as five ten thousandths of a second or fifty hundred thousandths or five hundred one millionths. 500 one millionths is 500 microseconds. Now that we've got that out of the way. Now let me draw a little diagram here which shows pulses and silent periods. And of course this is not the scale. Uh, the distance between two sets of pulses is 500 microseconds. Now, the, uh, uh, the difference, or the length of the, uh, the, length of the uh, pulse is 0 0.25, 0 0.25 microseconds. And I think you remember me talking about that a quarter of a millionth of a second. I mentioned that to you some time ago. So the length of the pulse is a quarter of a millionth of a second. That means that this pulse is 0 0.25 microseconds. 0.25 microseconds. The whole length from one pulse to the next pulse is 500 microseconds. So if this is only a quarter of a millionth of a second and this is 500 millionths of a second, if we subtract, we get 499.75 microseconds and this is the length of the silent period. And the length of the silent period is almost 2,000 times as long as the length of the pulse. Now most people don't figure that. They figure that the length of the silent period and the pulse are about the same length, but they're not. As you can see, almost 2,000 times as long. If this were drawn to scale, the next pulse would be out in the parking lot someplace. It is important though that you know this because it, uh, it will tell you a good many things about what can happen with your radar set. Interference. Interference is something that, uh, that you're going to see from time to time. And uh, interference is always, not always, but usually caused by another vessel being in the area and uh, transmitting a signal at the same time as, uh, as uh, your radar set is on. And you will usually pick up radial lines. These lines will be curved spiral lines uh, composed of dots. There's a picture of them on page 49 if you'd like to take a look at them. And uh, you'll notice <clears throat> each of those dots represents a pulse from a radar. Usually when you pick up interference, uh, you'll pick up a lot of interference out in the Gulf where there are a good many of the, uh, the oil boats that are running out there. Uh, usually this will mean that there is an other vessel in the vicinity, not necessarily a contact, that is transmitting at the same or nearly the same frequency as yours. In other, in other words, if you have a three centimeter radar, they probably have a three centimeter radar. Or if you have a 10, they probably have a 10. And this is what it appears like. You'll see spiral lines and they will be composed of dots. Now there's a difference between this and what we call spoking. Spoking uh, will usually appear as a straight line from the center, almost out to the outer edge, in some cases all the way to the outer edge and spoking usually indicates that there is something wrong with your radar set. Blind spots. Uh, blind spots are caused usually by uh, something that is sticking up in front of your antenna. If you go and stand right at your antenna and look out, and if you see a mast or a king post, a boom, 
wires, anything that may be in direct uh, view of your, of your antenna, that is going to cause a blind spot. It's a very important thing that if you have a blind spot aboard your boat or ship, that you indicate somewhere on the radar set, blind spot, zero to five degrees, or whatever it might be, and make sure that that is posted on your radar somewhere so that anytime someone who is not familiar with your vessel comes aboard, a pilot for example, he will know immediately that there is a blind spot uh, in that area. The way most blind spots appear will be by showing up as a shadow sector on your radar set. There is a good picture of, uh, of a shadow sector on page 56 where you will see there's a shadow sector both ahead and astern, which means that the, probably the astern uh, shadow is caused possibly by the, by the stack and the forward one maybe by one of, the, one of the masts. And it shows up as a shadow sector in, in a light sea return. Now there are a number of controls that are used to control sea return and uh, <clears throat> since we're talking about sea return it is called the STC, Sensitivity Time Control. Uh, this control is either a, an on-off switch or a variable control switch. If it is an on-off switch, when you turn it on, it automatically cuts down your gain from zero out to eight miles. And when I'm saying cuts down on the gain, that is exactly what it does. And if it cuts down on your gain, it means that from then on, that you are not, you do not have the power in those eight miles to pick up possible close-in contacts. Whenever you use the STC control, be sure that you keep a much better visual lookout than you normally would. Also, if you are out at sea, you're using the STC control to cut down on sea return, and you're coming into harbor, possibly going to pick up a pilot, make sure that you either tell the pilot that the STC control is on or shut it off, because if you don't, he may not realize that he is not able to pick up close-in contacts as well as he should. The other control is a variable STC control, and it is variable out from zero out to eight miles, and you can control the distance out. In other words, if your sea return is only out one or two miles, you can control it out to one or two miles instead of the uh, normal eight miles. FTC control, fast time constant. This control is used to, to cut down on rain return, rain or uh, whatever other type of precipitation you might have. It will cut down on it. It will not only cut down on it, it will cut through it, uh, providing that it is uh, a rain squall that is not too heavy. And the way it does it, it cuts down on short pulses and certainly an echo, or short echoes I should say, certainly a, an echo from a raindrop is short. But if you have a big, a real heavy rainstorm, uh, it will not cut through it. And <clears throat> uh, if, if it were me, I would treat the rain squall as if it were a contact and try to avoid it. Because you certainly would have a lot of explaining to do if you said, yes, I saw the rain squall, but uh, I had my radar on and I didn't see anything, so I went through it. And when you get halfway through, there's a ship right in the middle of it, you'd have some uh, difficult problems to explain. So be sure that you understand what the FTC control does. It does not necessarily cut through all rain squalls or heavy weather. There's one other thing that I'd like to show you, and I think this is important. This happened over in the Mediterranean. Uh, it happens almost every day uh, up in the inland waters of the United States. And if you have never seen it and don't know what it is, the first time you see it, it might uh, scare you. So I think it's an important thing that you understand it. There is a large bay over the Mediterranean somewhere and uh, there was one of the large passenger ships that was going in to uh, load some cargo and uh, I'm not going to tell you what company it was but the, but the vessel was coming in and it was over on this side of the channel and it picked up a pip dead ahead right there and of course they really were not too worried about it at that time. They moved over closer to the center of the channel. Now the pip moved over here. They continued on over to this side of the channel 
And now the pip was here. And of course, by that time, they figured it was a vessel that was crossing the channel, and they weren't too worried about it. So they came back to the middle of the channel. Now the pip moved here. The captain decided that someone was playing games with him, and he anchored. You imagine his surprise when he went into the chart room and looked in the chart, and what do you suppose he saw? An overhead cable running across the channel. And this is the way it appeared as pips dead ahead. And I think probably to better explain why they appear that way is if you'll re remember back when we talked about aspect. And you remember that we said that when you had a contact, a flat, that had a flat vertical surface, that you would get back the best uh, reflection that you could possibly get. Remember that the cable is not very big. What, a couple of inches probably around. As long as that beam, that radar beam, strikes it at a right angle, it's going to reflect something back. But when it strikes it at an angle, one way or the other, it will not. It will probably glance off in either direction, <clears throat> and you're not going to get anything back. So the only place that you're going to get <clears throat> back an echo from a cable is going to be when you strike it dead ahead at right angles. And that's what's happening here. And you can ask any of the captains who uh, pilot their vessels through inland waters. If you've never seen this, it'll surprise you the first time. And of course, after you've seen it the first time, you remember what it is. For those of you who have never seen it, now you know what it looks like. It shouldn't surprise you. <clears throat> One other thing I think is important uh, that I think uh, you should think about a little bit there are many times, and I think possibly the best way for me to describe this would be to put another little diagram up here. Most of the time, uh, if you were coming through an area and there were a number of points of land, and you were coming through the middle, and you wanted to decide where you were, you would probably take a bearing of this point, and a bearing of this point, and a bearing of this point, and try to get yourself a position. What most people don't realize is that bearings are not as accurate as ranges. And the reason they're not as accurate is because you must remember that your beam is, is very wide, and uh, therefore you're not going to get a real accurate fix. Also, and I'm going to show you this in a few minutes, <clears throat> your coastlines do not always appear on radar as they are. Uh, they are going to appear quite a bit different from the way they look on a chart. Next time you come into a situation like this, take a range of that, of that uh, point, take a range of that point, and take another range of that point, and where those three cross will probably give you a much better position than trying to take bearings of those points. Try it next time. You'll find also that the ranges <clears throat> are a lot more accurate than bearings. Uh, I'd like you to turn to page 40. And on page 40, you will, uh, you will see uh, some, some diagrams of uh, land masses. <clears throat> and if you look at the first picture to the left, you'll see that the, uh, there is a, a bump or a hump of land that's sticking out. And yet, the, the radar shoreline, which is the, fa the uh, uh, shaded area, shows up almost as a straight line. Uh, the next one to the right, the one in the middle in the upper uh, section, there's an island there. And because, as I explained to you, the width of the beam, the width of that beam cannot separate the land mass from the island, it appears as if that island were a peninsula rather than an island. Uh, the next uh, picture at the top to the right shows two, uh, two sections of land and the radar beam cannot get between those two sections of land and show them up as two separate and distinct parcels of land. And therefore, you've got a straight coastline. And if you were going to go in between those two pieces of land, you wouldn't know where they were until you got a lot closer. Because of the width of the beam, it cannot separate those two pieces of land. Uh, the, the last three pictures in the bottom uh, show a, uh, a, a small bay or inlet. And yet, according to the radar picture, that bay or inlet is not there. So I think you can see that the radar picture is not a true picture at all. There are many things that you cannot see when you use radar. That completes our uh, information on the theory of the radar. 
and uh, I think that, I hope I should say that, uh, that you have learned something from it. There are a good many things that occur when you look into your radar scope. Remember the first day that you came here that we talked about the picture on the radar is not true, and I think you found that out. And now as we've gone through the theory, you have also found out pictures that you see on the radar are not true. Land masses do not appear where they're supposed to appear. Uh, you are going to see things that, that uh, normally you would not expect on the radar. So it is important. I would suggest if you get a chance, read over the, uh, the chapters on radar, on uh, theory, so that you'll get a little better understanding than what I've given you here. Thank you.